Good morning, friends. I'm glad that you're here with us at Grove United Methodist Church on this Father's Day. I'm getting ready for worship. It's almost time, and so I need to go ahead and put my stole on, and then I need to do some checks, so just hang with me for just a moment, okay? I need to double-check the mirror and make sure that I'm looking. Yeah, okay, I think, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. You know what? Maybe instead of a checking the mirror to look at me, maybe I ought to just simply to reflect upon the Christ. Today is Father's Day, and we are called to focus on what it means to be a good leader, what it means to make the right choices, the God choices in our lives. I am glad that you're here with us. Let us worship God together. the call to worship. People of God, you are welcome in the presence of God no matter what has happened in your life. We worship the God who sees the end from the beginning and already knows the outcome of every situation. People of God, you are welcome in the presence of God no matter how you look. We rejoice to know that God looks beyond good looks or accomplishments, wealth or social connections. God sees the heart. No matter who we are or how life has treated us, we are all welcome in God's house.
Lord God, refresh us with living water. Illumine our path with your light. Speak to us with a still, small voice and calm the storms of our lives with your peace. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 34 through 16. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Jebeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elahab and thought, Surely his anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shemahab pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And Samuel said to Jesse, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said again to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and he brought him. Now he was a ruddy and had a beautiful eyes and he was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The Gospel reading is for Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. He also said, The kingdom of God is as, as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, and then the full grain of the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches, 
so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for that reading of God's word. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you for your written word that does become a living word within us as we respond to your call upon our lives. Lord, we are here today to worship you, and as we move deeper into this message, we ask that you will continue to open our minds and our hearts to hear, to receive, and to respond to all that you say to us today. Lord, allow this servant to decrease in order that you may increase. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all you dads with us today. I wonder, do you look, ever look in a mirror and see the face of your father? I know that has happened to my father and to my brother and to some other men that I know. It's not unusual to look a little bit like your dad even as you grow older, and sometimes even perhaps you will have the same habits or the same mannerism as your father. Today, we're going to look in a mirror. But the mirror that we're going to look in is through the Holy Scriptures. We're going to look in a mirror in order to be able to choose a king, to make the right vote for the new leader, so to say. We're in the chapter of first, or in the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to back up from the chapter that we read from earlier to chapter 8, where Samuel is growing old. We can imagine that his eyesight is beginning to dim. He's not quite as bright as he, as he once was. And those around him begin to see that, and the people call for a new king. They call, actually not for a new king, they call for a king. They want to be like other nations. And so God tells Samuel, Samuel, you need to let them know what they're asking for. They really need to observe and um, look at and really dig into what these other kings are doing and how they're ruling over their people. Because you see, the leaders around the nation of Israel were actually rulers who were taking land and setting up a system in which it was not a system of equality as God calls for it within God's word, but actually a system where there were those who have and those who have not, those in power and those who would be slaves. And this is what God says for Samuel to tell the people. And nevertheless, they still called for a king. So the wills began to be set in motion. And the first king to be named is King Saul. And in chapter 9, beginning with verse 15, we read this, in which God speaks to Samuel regarding Saul. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be ruler or prince over my people, Israel. Now ruler, prince, does not equate to the word king. That's the first thing we need to recognize, which is a, a way for us to kind of sit up and take note, oh my gosh, something different is going on here. But nevertheless, as we move through the story, the people call for Saul to become king. And you know where they find him? They find him hiding among the packages, hiding among the surplus, as it is written. And he's hiding like in a storage shed. And yet they drag this person out and they decide that he is going to become king. And so Samuel anoints 
Saul king. And Saul does a pretty good job against the Philistines, but then it comes to the point in which Saul, well, he gets too big for his britches in some ways. He uh, usurps God's rule. He was dependent upon Samuel to come out of his retirement, so to say, in order to be able to serve as the priest during the time that Saul ruled, a consultant to King Saul. But there was a time in which Samuel delayed in his coming, and Saul got really scared about that. And so he went ahead and gathered together the sacrifice that was to be made to God. Now, that in of itself was not under Saul's um, authority to do. It was actually Samuel's authority as the priest to offer the sacrifices to God. But Saul became fearful of the people, afraid that the people were going to abandon him, afraid that, that they would leave him behind and that they would no longer follow his authority and his rule, for he ruled with power. So after God rejected Saul, God told Samuel, I'm going to raise up a new king, a king that is after my own heart. And so the Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. 16 verse 1, fill your horn with oil and set out and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And so Samuel, with a little bit of trepidation, goes on to Jesse's house. And I imagine that once he arrived, he was a bit excited because he found out that Jesse had several sons, but he didn't know which one to pick because, my goodness, they were all handsome. They were all at the house. And so Jesse sent one after the other in front of Samuel, and Samuel would look at this, this young man and God would say, no, not this one, not this one, not this one, until all of the sons that were in the house that were handsome, good-looking, of great stature, could make great kings. They, they, they looked really good in front of the camera, you know. Well, none of those. And again, Samuel became a little bit confused, a little bit concerned. And he looked at Jesse and he said, do you not have any other sons? And Jesse says, oh, yes, 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 yes. There is the youngest. There is the youngest. But he is out in the fields, and he's tending the sheep. And we can imagine that perhaps this shepherd boy had been out there for a while, and I don't know how many farmers we have in our community of worshipers this morning. But if you've ever worked on a farm, when you come in, a lot of times you need to take your shoes off, you need to go get a bath because farming can be really hard and sometimes dirty work. Well, they call for this youngest son of Jesse's to come forward. And sure enough, he comes in and he's, he's handsome, but oh my goodness, he's ruddy meaning red. Now, was it because, as some biblical scholars say, that maybe he had red hair? The rabbis also believe that, that perhaps he had red hair. Or was it his skin was red? Or I might like to think, my goodness, he's been out in the sun here in June, and the weather's been pretty good, and he's gotten a nice suntan. His body's all burnished brown. He had beautiful eyes, we are told. And so God says to Samuel, rise and anoint this one. Rise and anoint this one. So Samuel, in verse 13, takes the horn of oil and anoints him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David that day forward. And then Samuel leaves the scene and goes on his way. We like that story because we know quite a bit about David. We know that he was made king. 
We also know that he was human, that he made mistakes. We also know that sometimes David even feared for his life as King Saul pursued him. But nevertheless, this was one who always sought the Lord's heart. So when Saul eventually ceases to be king and David rises to the throne, it makes me wonder, how do we choose our leaders? Do we choose them based on their power? Do we choose them based on their status? Do we choose them based on how much money they have or how they can pull people together and, and wheel and deal? Or do we choose, do we vote based on their character and their heart? Even Samuel, when he went to Jesse's sons, began to look at each one of those sons and thought any of them could be king. They're handsome. They, they're, they're upright. They, they're, they look like they have authority. And the people will surely follow them. But God looked for the one. God looked for the one who would reflect the Lord our God. How do you and I make a right vote? Surely if we just judge on appearance, we too may make a wrong choice just as the people did when they said that they wanted Saul to be king. Do you know where they actually found Saul in order to be able to anoint him as king? They found him hiding among the surplus goods not in a field, tending and loving some of the most vulnerable in the community. How do we choose the one, the right one who will reflect God's image, who will reflect the God who created us, who desired that there would be only one king and one Lord over all of God's people, and that would be the Lord God alone. We choose through discernment in prayer. We choose by looking for the one who will reflect the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. We choose based on the one who will rule in righteousness with power and equity, not for just a few, but for all. So my prayer is, is that all of the parents, all of the fathers, all of the mothers will reflect the Lord our God, will reflect the love that Jesus Christ has for each and every one of us. And as we go into this election year, as we make our choices for all of our local national leaders, even as we choose leaders within our own churches or we choose who we will follow as a leader, whether it's a coach or a teacher, I pray that you will make your choice through prayer, through discernment, and looking for those who reflect our God and the character and love of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we come to our time of praying for one another and praying for our community, our nation, our church, our world, I invite you to remember all of those on the prayer list from the church here at Grove United Methodist and the prayers that are on your hearts as well. As part of our prayer time together, we'll spend a few moments in silent prayer, and then we will be sharing in a prayer that is drawn from two prayers within our book of worship, one written by Ruth Duck and the other by Andy Langford. Let us go to the Lord in prayer.
Lord God, on this Sabbath day, we come together remembering our fathers and giving thanks. We also acknowledge that in you, O oh God, every family on earth receives its name. And so we ask God that your light will shine within our homes on this earth, that that light may be the light of your love that will grant us courage, and especially courage for those who are hurt or are lonely, a light that will grant us endurance, especially for those who care for sick family members, a light of wisdom for all those in fear and who are afraid of change. We thank you for the gifts of love that we have received from our parents, from our mothers, from our fathers, from spouses, from our children or companions. As we have been loved by you and by others, so may we love. Almighty God, you are the ruler of all peoples of this earth. And so we ask, Lord, that you will be the wisdom that inspires the minds of all women and men to whom you have committed the responsibility of government and leadership in the nations of the world. We ask that that same wisdom work in the minds of all of our leaders, whether in churches, in education systems, in organizations, in wherever they may find themselves called to stand with and for a people. We ask that you give to them the vision of truth and justice that by their counsel that all nations, all peoples, all communities may truly work together. We pray, God, especially for our country as we are in a season of election, and we ask, Lord, that you will give the people of our country zeal for justice and strength for forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will that you will be the wisdom that goes with us to choose the leaders of this nation and within our local communities. And we ask, God, that you will forgive our shortcomings, both within ourselves as a church, as a people. Purify our hearts to see and to love the truth that is your truth. And we ask all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
so, my friends, it's time to go. It's time to go into the world and to offer Christ to others. It's time to go into the world to be Christ for others. It's time to go into the world and pray for the mind of Christ as you live and move and have your being in and among God's people. And so let us go. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.